In honor of Mother's Day, we've got going to do a special Mother's Day message for you here today. So open with me in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 1. That's in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Now let me tell you about the story of Hannah and her husband Elkanah. This is quite an interesting story because Elkanah had two wives. And so immediately you probably are thinking to yourself, what are you going to tell us about polygamy today, Steve? No, I'm not. Polygamy was not God's original intention. Very clearly, the Bible teaches that. Jesus said in Matthew 19, 8, he said that from the beginning, it was not so. And so for all of the ways that men have twisted and changed the original intention that God had, this is one of them. And so Paul also describes in Acts 17.30, he said, these were times of ignorance that God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. And so this is a, a story where two women are fighting with each other. Now, it's interesting. That's probably the best reason why polygamy is not a good idea. <laughs> because every place that you see a polygamous relationship, there are always conflicts between all the wives. So that should give you a little insight that that's probably not a good idea. So this particular story, Elkanah has two wives. He has Hannah and Penina. Now, Penina was a woman who had many, wives, many children, and uh, she mocked and irritated and insulted uh, Hannah over and over again because Hannah had no children. And we'll read this as we read through this story. And yet, Hannah was not satisfied with no children. She prayed, she sought the Lord, that God would provide and give her a child. Now, the reason why I'm telling you this story is because it's really incredible because the child that she has turns out to be the prophet Samuel. This man is pivotal in the history of the nation Israel. Just by the fact that we have two full books with his, by his name, First and Second Samuel, tells you how pivotal this man is in the nation. The nation has come through the period which is called the period of the judges. And so if you read judges, you can see very clearly that the nation has great problems, great trouble. And so God brings Samuel on the scene and he turns the nation completely around to follow and to serve the Lord. Ultimately, King David comes, uh, King Solomon, the pinnacle of the time of Israel's existence here as a nation. And so this is where we pick up this story. Let's just read beginning in verse 5. And it says there, but Hannah, but to Hannah he gave a double portion. Excuse me, let's go back to church, uh, verse 4. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. So she had plenty of children. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival, notice, the scripture describes her as a rival or an adversary, also provoked her which means to insult or to irritate. It provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So you can imagine the taunts, the statements, the little jabs that came from Peninnah. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. So the feast times were a time where they would come, they would offer their sacrifices, a portion of that sacrifice, they would eat, and they would rejoice together. 
And so Hannah was not rejoicing. It says in verse 8, Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Oh, would to God that every husband in this room would be better to their wives than ten sons. Verse 9, so Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. So she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will, indeed, look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head, which was a part of the Nazarite vow. And it, it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard, which is where we get silent prayer. Silent prayer is just as effective as verbal, audible prayer. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put away your your, put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. In other words, this was her continual prayer. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went away and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Why? Because she believed. She believed the word of Eli the priest. Then they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. And returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, which means heard by God. Saying of Samuel, because I have asked of him from the Lord, now the man Elkanah and his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. Notice now that here Elkanah takes Hannah's vow and it becomes his vow as well. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned, then I will take him that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. So Elkanah and her husband, her husband said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him, which most likely would have been about three years of age. Only let the Lord establish his word. So this man believed in the word of the Lord. Then the woman stayed and nursed the son until she had weaned him. Now when they had, she had weaned him, she took him up with her, with three bowls, one ephah of flour, a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. Can you imagine leaving your three-year-old at the temple? That's incredible. Then she slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Eli. And they said, O oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here, praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him or given him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent or given to the Lord. 
So they worshiped the Lord there. Now, this is a time in Israel's history when the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle was at a place called Shiloh, about 20 miles north of Jerusalem. Shiloh is, I, I have been there before, it's a very interesting place. It's a, an incredibly flat plateau area and it has these mountains that are kind of like a natural amphitheater that where the people could just sit on the hills and look down and see exactly what was going on. They could hear very well as the, any preaching went on. And it was, it's a beautiful place. And it's in the hill country of uh, central Israel. And so today you can go there. They have Iron Age um, dwelling places that they have found there. They're, there's still an outline, a rock outline of where the tabernacle would have stood. And it's, it's just an incredible place to be. But it is completely desolate because the Lord destroyed it, because of the rebellion of the nation Israel long after Samuel went. But at this point, there is a, an incredible revival that is about to take place, and it is all centered in this one man's life. So one woman, one mother, affects the destiny of an entire nation by the life she has, and the prayer that she prayed, and the obedience that she had in her heart to the Lord. And that really is the story of this first chapter. So how did Hannah change the nation by what she did? Well, there are three things here that I think are essential. The first is that she was a woman of faith and perseverance. So she could have said, Lord, you've given me a barren womb. Why should I believe in you? In fact, I'm not going to believe in you. You haven't given me anything, so I'm not going to trust in you. She could have responded that way, but she did not. She responded in faith, coming to the Lord over and over again. How do we know she was a woman of faith? Well, because she pursued the Lord. She pursued the Lord continually. And she poured out her soul to God. Notice at the end of verse 15. I love that little phrase. But have poured out my soul before the Lord. This is only something that a woman of faith does. To pour out her soul. She was a woman who also worshipped. She worshipped with her husband. Notice verse 19. When they are headed back to their home... It says they arose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. So she was a, a woman who worshipped. She did the very same thing at the end of verse 28 with Eli when she brings Samuel to leave him at the tabernacle. And what does it say there? So they worshipped the Lord there. So this is a woman of faith. And it's, she's a woman of faith that persevered. She did not give up. Now, it's easy to trust the Lord when everything is going fine, right? It's easy to trust God then. It's another thing to trust God when everything is going wrong, when you don't see all the blessings that God has promised coming your way. That's when it takes faith to persevere. Now, this is something that all through the Scripture we see. We see men and women who persevere in faith. And here is one great example. Hannah was a woman who persevered in faith, in prayer, in worship. She was a woman who pursued God. And she did that because of her perseverance. Notice in verse 7, it says, So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that her the other wife of Elkanah provoked her, insulted her. So this went on year after year after year. I mean, can you sense maybe a possibility somebody might get a little upset, a little bit bitter, a little, get, a little bit angry? But Hannah says, I'm going to trust the Lord. What did she do? She prayed. But she did that because she was persevering in faith. 
Now, persevering and faith always go together. You will see this over and over again throughout the scripture. If someone has true faith, they are going to persevere. They're going to persevere in whatever they are trusting the Lord for. Let me show you this in the scripture. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, as Peter is encouraging the church there to grow in their faith and in their, their walk and relationship with him, this is what he says. And also for this very reason, giving all diligence, Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness. So I am to give my attention and diligence to adding perseverance to my faith. And that only takes place when things are rough, when things are tough. So if you're in one of those tough places, those difficult places right now, today, this is where you need to add perseverance to your faith. Because the result of that will be godliness. Godliness. That's what Peter declares. And so this is what took place in her life. Jesus, in Revelation 3.10, to the church of uh, Philadelphia, he says to them there, this is my command. He says, because you have kept my command to persevere. So perseverance is not an option. It's a command. If you believe me, then you need to persevere. And you only need to persevere when it's tough. He said, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. In other words, Jesus is saying, because you have persevered and kept my word, then I am going to keep you out of the great tribulation. This is one of the great promises that the church will not go through the tribulation period. This is the word of Jesus, and I'm, I'm going to stand on this word, and I'm going to believe it. In Psalm 112, verse 7, David said of a godly man, that he will not be afraid of evil tidings. Why? His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. So steadfastness is the same as perseverance. Steadfastness comes from trusting the Lord. That's where it comes from. If you want to be steadfast, then you've got to trust the Lord. If you want to persevere, you've got to trust the Lord. Now, faith is revealed in these times. Faith is revealed when everything that you see around you is going the opposite direction. Everything that you feel inside is, is not well. You hear that still, small, little voice inside you from your adversary. You see, Penina uh, was the adversary of Hannah. And you have another adversary the devil, as a roaring lion who goes about seeking whom he may devour. And Peter said in 1 Peter 5, 9, resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So you need to be steadfast. You need to hang in there. You need to hold on to him because that's the way you're going to get through that difficulty that you're in the midst of right now. Every one of us is in the same place. We all have tough times in our life. We all have difficult people we have to deal with that sometimes irritate us and mock us. And you got to deal with those people. There, there isn't any way to go around them. You have to go through them. You have to keep on moving forward because that's the way life is. If you run from them, I guarantee you, you'll be running all your life. But notice here that she did not have perfect faith. Hannah did not have perfect faith. She is distraught. She's weeping at times. God doesn't require perfect faith to respond, to help you, to strengthen you. 
to guide your steps. He doesn't require perfect faith. He requires you to use the faith that you have, to exercise the faith that you have. You see, the Bible says that every one of us that believes has been given a measure of faith. It may be this measure, a little tiny bit, or it might be a big measure of faith. But you have a measure of faith. And depending on your measure of faith, he is going to ask you to exercise that faith. One of the best examples of this is in Mark chapter 9, verse 24. There is um, the story of a man who brought his son, who was demon-possessed, to the disciples, and the disciples could not help him, could not cast the demon out. This man persevered. He believed. He had heard the stories. Jesus heals, and he would not be denied. And so he takes his son directly to Jesus. That's perseverance, if you ask me. And what does he do? Jesus speaks to him, and immediately it says, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. So, did Jesus answer that prayer? Yes, he did. Notice all the man did was exercise the faith he did have. And then the Lord responded and helped him, even where he was struggling. And he had unbelief. I guarantee you, every one of us in this room have areas of unbelief in our lives. God is going to bring you to those places where you have to exercise the faith that you have and that he might touch and give to you what he desires. The second thing that is interesting here in this story is that not only was Hannah a woman of faith and perseverance, but she was a woman of prayer. Now, This is something that you see over and over again through this section, and it is clearly the intent of, of the Holy Spirit to challenge anybody that's reading this with what kind of prayer do they, what kind of prayer life do they have? Because literally that is the point. Notice verse 10. It says there that she was in bitterness of soul. Did she stay in bitterness of soul? Or did that bitterness of soul lead her to pray? And she prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. So when you are weeping in anguish and you are overwhelmed, that is when you pray. And those prayers are powerful, I guarantee you. They are prayers of faith because you know you are at your you are at your extremity. You come to those places where you just say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know where to go. I don't know how to handle this. What do I do, Lord? And when you come to those places, you need to cry out in faith, in prayer, and the Lord will hear you. He heard this woman. He will hear you. Then notice in verse 12, it says, and it happened as she continued praying before the Lord. So, This was not just a one-time little quick shoot-em-up prayer up to heaven. No, she was continually praying this way. And verse 7 reveals that she did this year by year. A long time went by. And then in verse 27, she declares, verse 27, For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. So what are you asking the Lord for? What is your petition before him now? What are those where are those places where you're just at your extremity? You're at your limit. You're just it's just above you, just beyond you. You just say, I don't I don't know. You say, Well, I don't have any of those places. Well, you're a better man than me, let me tell you. Because I got them. And I know you've you've got them. You just have to recognize them because you either recognize your insufficiency and your weakness and your inability or you blind yourself and you try and do it yourself and it only gets worse. 
the harder you try, the worse it gets. Are you willing to surrender? I can't fix my marriage. I can't fix my attitude. I can't fix whatever. Fill in the blank. I can't fix it, but you can fix it. You are able to fix it. And so that's why you pray. She knew what she wanted, and she knew who to ask. And she went for it. So do you know who to ask? And do you ask him on a regular basis? Do you realize you need divine intervention? I hope you do. Now this is, I believe, what makes a person a man of God, a woman of God, a woman after God's heart, a man after God's heart, is this attitude of faith connected with prayer. This is what David said all through the Psalms. You see, David had conflict and problem after problem in his life. And what did he do? He went to the Lord. He let that bitterness of soul bring him to the place of prayer. In Psalm 61, verses 1 through 4, notice what David says. He says, Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I will cry to you. I'm not going to cry out to all my friends. I'm going to cry out to you. And then he said, when my heart is overwhelmed. Not if my heart is overwhelmed. When. It's going to happen. It's going to happen this week, next week. Your heart's going to come to a place you're going to be overwhelmed. And at that moment, that's when you will determine where are you going. To whom are you going to look? To yourself, to friends, or to the Lord? And then he goes on here to say, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I need help that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever, I will trust in the shelter of your wings. So notice, David put together, I will trust in the shadow and the shelter of your wings. And he put that together with prayer. Faith and prayer enabled him to overcome when he was overwhelmed. So this is a very natural thing, a natural way to deal with the struggles that we go through. Turn to him. Now, Hannah could have turned very bitter, but she didn't. She turned to the Lord in prayer, and she cried out. She persevered in prayer. So to persevere in faith will mean that you will persevere in prayer. The two must go together. To persevere in faith, you must persevere in prayer. Let me show you this. In Luke 18, verses 1 through 8 there, it says, Then Jesus spoke a parable to them. It says that men ought always to pray and not lose heart. So what keeps you from losing heart, from being overwhelmed? You pray. Very clearly taught here by Christ. So if you're overwhelmed on a regular basis, it means that you're not trusting him and you are not praying enough. You need to cry out. And so he declares here, saying, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest her by her continual coming she weary me. I mean, isn't that incredible? This guy just says, you know, just to keep her from bugging me, I'm going to help her. Because she just keeps continually coming and over and over again. And then Jesus said, the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. In verse 7, it says, 
Shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? You see, this is the point. You see, he is a God who does care about men. He does care about you. He does care about justice. This judge didn't care about justice, and he didn't care about men. He, didn't, he could care less. And he answered, how much more will the Lord answer if you cry out to him day and night? And then Jesus ends this with, he said, will the Son of Man find faith on the earth like this when he comes? Will he find this kind of faith? The tribulation period is going to be such an intense and terrible time. The last days will get worse and worse. That's what the scripture says. So are you ready? Are you a man or a woman of prayer? And do you pray like this, persevering for what is true? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. He will. That is his desire. That is his heart. And so why? Why does she persevere in prayer? Why does she do this? Because she believed. She trusted him. And she kept on praying. I believe that this prayer of faith is an essential aspect of this whole story. You see, somebody who believes, but they don't pray, well, I have not because I ask not. It is an essential thing. This part of this story is essential. To become this woman of faith, you need to be a woman of prayer. So prayer enables you not to lose heart. Now, notice God doesn't answer her prayer instantaneously. doesn't answer her prayer quickly. It went on year after year. This went on. But finally, he does answer. And he does in his own timing. Now, will you get angry at him because he doesn't answer in your timing? Or will you say, no, I will just continue to persevere? You know, there are people in my family that I've been praying for for 45 years. And I am not going to stop praying for them. You see, I saw the fruit of that when I had my mother come and live with us for her last eight months of her life. And as I watched her grow weaker and weaker, as she watched us, I saw her heart turn and change toward the Lord. Until pretty soon, she was telling her caregivers how they needed to get know Jesus Christ. And she would then pray with me where she never did before. You see, you never know how long it takes because God is working in people's lives at his own time, in his own way. I don't know what and how the Lord has it planned for you, but you've got to trust him. It may take many years, but you've got to trust him and you've got to persevere. This is, I think, one of the most important promises and, and encouragements in Scripture that is given to us in Hebrews 10, 35 through 36. There the apostle says, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. In other words, don't give up. He says, For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. So, Trust him. You know, those people that you're praying for in your family that do not know him or are not following him, the story is not over yet. So keep praying and persevere in faith because the Lord is here. He hears you and he will respond. Now, the third thing in this, the last item here is that this woman was a woman of devotion and a woman of obedience. She worshipped the Lord with her husband. She worshipped with Eli the priest. She was obedient. She kept her vow. I mean, it's very interesting here. Without this part of the story, without her keeping her vow and bringing Samuel back to the temple, 
and offering him to serve there in the temple? Well, Samuel would have never become a man who heard the voice of the Lord, who saw God work, saw his power, and then become this man that God used to turn an entire nation around. Because this issue of her keeping her vow, keeping her promise, I mean, you know how it goes. You know, you make those promises to the Lord and you say, oh Lord, if you do this, I'll do that. And then after he does what he, you've asked him to do, then you say, oh, but, you know, Lord, you know, I, I don't think you really want me to give up my three-year-old son to take to the temple. I mean, I'm, I'm his mother. I, I'm his only, you know, I mean, his strength and his, I need to train him up. And uh, Lord, you'll understand, won't you, if we just change the deal a little bit here. I mean, she could have said that. And what would that have been? It would have been a compromise. So have you made a vow to the Lord? A vow is just a promise where you say, Lord, I promise I will serve you. I will seek you. Just Would you just answer this prayer? But have you done it? Have you kept your promise? If you haven't, you need to repent and you need to ask God to give you the grace to keep your promise. I know, we, we make those promises. And don't, you shouldn't take that lightly. Let me read to you what it says in the Old Testament concerning vows. God says in Deuteronomy 23, verse 21, he says, when you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you. And it would be a sin to you. That is, if you do not respond. Then he says in verse 22, but if you sustain or abstain from vowing, but if you abstain from vowing, it shall not be a sin to you. In other words, if you don't want to make a vow, that's great. That's fine. That's between you and your own heart, your own conscience. It's not going to be a sin if you don't make a vow or promise me anything. But he says in verse 23, that which has gone from your lips, you shall keep and perform. For you voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. Now, this is an important thing. This is why Jesus said in the New Testament, let your yes be yes and your no, no. In other words, be a man or a woman of your word. Because if you say, oh yeah, I'll do that, sure. Oh, but I'm a little tired tonight. I think I'll pass. That is breaking your word. If you, if you give your word, you need to keep your word because that is something God requires of you. David said in Psalm 61, 8, now this is a few verses down from the passage we read a moment ago about him being overwhelmed and he was rejoicing because the Lord had taken care of that struggle that he was in the midst of. Now he says this, So I will sing praise to your name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. It's a very interesting statement because David knew the importance of making that vow and keeping it, doing what he had promised to do. So God has promised and he is able also to perform. God promises all the time, and he is able to perform it. This is what Abraham believed in Romans 4.21. He says, being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. So what you have promised, you need to perform. That's what the scripture declares. And so if it's if I want it good one way, it needs to be good the other way as well. So both are just as essential. So this vow and promise that she made to the Lord, she comes, she says in 
I, I think it's just so beautiful, verse 27. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. You see, the Lord heard her. That's why she named him Samuel, heard by God. You see, God hears what you say. He hears. He, he hears every single statement, every prayer. He knows whether it's a prayer in faith or not. He knows whether you mean to keep your vow or not. He knows. And this woman said, I am going to keep and obey and keep the commitment that I have made to the Lord. What happened? Notice 1 Samuel 3, 19 through 21. It says, so Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. Wow. Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. And let none of his words fall to the ground. In other words, when he prophesied, it came to pass. This was a man who had the example of a mother who kept her word. And he saw God keep his word as well. And then it says there, And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Dan is the northernmost city in Israel. Beersheba is the southernmost city in the Negev desert. So the entire nation knew that Samuel had been anointed and called by God. They knew it. Why? Because when Samuel spoke a word from the Lord, it came to pass. And then it says, I think which is quite interesting, then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. Wow. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. What does this mean? Well, some supernatural demonstration of his presence. Was it the fire by night and the cloud by day over the tabernacle as they went through the, the wilderness? Was it that or was there some other supernatural way that people knew the Lord had returned. You see, this man turned an entire nation around and brought revival, brought restoration, brought obedience to God. And it was all because of what one mother prayed for. Powerful. Now, I know you're probably thinking to yourself, well, Steve, hey, I don't have any Samuel the prophet in my house. Um, but you have a son or daughter in your house. And what would the Lord require of you to raise them in the way of the Lord? As a mother, as a father, you need to raise them in the ways of the Lord. That requires you to train them, to discipline them, to be that example of truth and commitment that when you say something, it, you mean it. It's the truth. They see you as a man or a woman of prayer. They see you praying with your spouse. They see you obedient to God. They see you pursuing God. Why? Because... That's a big deal. That is an example to your children that you cannot underestimate. So don't underestimate one woman who believed God, who prayed, who persevered, who obeyed and kept her commitment. Don't underestimate that example to your family. And so... That goes for you too, dads, because I guarantee you, you're as much an example as your wife is. So I encourage you today, hear his voice, listen to him, and be obedient to him. Amen? Amen. Let's go to my prayer. Father, thank you so much for this example of, of Samuel, or the example of Hannah. And Lord, I know that you've given us this example so that we might do it, that we might keep it, that we might 
follow on in this example. And so, Lord, I pray that you would make us men and women, Lord, that truly are examples to our children, that, Lord, you would cause our children then to be godly men and women who will raise other godly men and women, who will then raise other godly men and women, that it would proceed and multiply exponentially. Lord, one child can become a multitude. One mother can become a multitude. One father, a multitude. Lord, I pray that you would give us that understanding, give us that heart to live and to walk with you. Lord, I believe your Holy Spirit is is touching each of our hearts here today. And Lord, I pray that you would you would just seal this truth deep in our hearts. Lord, that we might see the, the fruit of following you, of worshiping you, of being men and women of truth, of commitment, of perseverance. Lord, do that work in each of us. Lord, we believe you to do that. We believe you're doing it right now inside of each of us. Thank you, Lord. And if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I want to encourage you. The only way that any of this that I've talked about this morning will ever come to pass is if you turn your life over to him and surrender to him and follow him. And if you're not doing that, you know it. And you are the only one who can turn that ship around. You're the only one who can turn your life around. You make a decision and you pray and you ask God's forgiveness and you invite him to come in and take over your life. And when you do that, he will change you. He'll transform you. And he will begin that work inside of you that he will perform each and every day until he returns. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to submit yourself to him, ask his forgiveness, and follow him? If you are, pray with me right now. Just say in your heart, just as Hannah did, without verbal, without words, just in your heart, just say, Lord, I am a sinner. God, forgive me. Jesus, come in and take over my life right now. Fill me and flood me with your Holy Spirit. Change me. I want to be your disciple. I want to follow you. If any of you prayed that prayer here this morning, you need to make a confession of that. You need to acknowledge it, that you prayed with me. Right, just lifting your hand here, a simple acknowledgement, so that I can pray for you. Anyone here? Just lift your hand up. Father, we give you praise for, Lord, the work of your spirit in each of us. Lord, now help us, Lord, to reach out and to touch those who do not know you and to lead those to know you as we know you. Lord, we give you praise this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.